there are uh, a lot of you that ask me questions, Bible questions, uh, things you don't understand, uh, and it takes up some of my time uh, of answering the questions as they come by email. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not saying this to send me a whole bunch more questions, so uh, it does consume my time because uh, I do want you to have answers or directions to things uh, to understand God better. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever contemplated, like, who do I call? Who, who do I ask? Because uh, I have lots of questions. Uh, uh, I might have lots of degrees and have studied and all those types of things, but there are still lots of things in the scriptures I'm like, why do you do that? Uh, does this happen to you? I know it does because you write, write about them when you send me your emails. Uh, and I always look at them and kind of smile because it's like, yeah, I've asked the same thing myself. So what I want to do is I, w- I want to present to you one of my questions. Uh, and it will, this question will take a few minutes to set up. Uh, and then this question is going to then pivot into questions that Paul is asking in Romans chapter 9. So if you're wondering where is he going with this, I always have a direction, right? You only trust me uh, to a point. So yes, we are going somewhere with this. So just hang on. Here is my question. A thing I don't really understand totally. I would do a degree, but then it's like, what? Uh, in the Old Testament, um, the Ark of the Covenant was centered to Israel. I mean, it was like the presence of God dwelt over the, the cherubim. Uh, that's where the mercy seat was in the Holy of Holies. Uh, and this was a special uh, artifact in Israel because it contained the, the Mosaic Covenant, the tablets, and etc. cetera. Uh, Aaron's rod that bedded, et cetera, was inside the box, the golden box, uh, with the cherubim, uh, angelic class over the top of that. Um, if, when Israel took this into battle, if they, were success, if they were walking with God, they were successful in battle. If they were disobedient to God, it uh, wasn't some magic talisman that gave them instant victory. Uh, but sometimes they would forget about that. So they go to the battle, uh, it's called the Battle of Aphek. Uh, it was in 1104 BC, and that's important to understand that date, 1104 BC. They took the Ark of the Covenant with them, and they battled in 1 Samuel 4, they battled against the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines defeated them at the Battle of Aphek, and they seized the Ark of the Covenant, God forbid. Uh, and they took the, I have a map here, because this is a map-loving church right? Yes, you love uh, spreadsheets, etc. I, g- I get it after 10 years. So here, here's a map. So they lost at the Battle of Aphek, 1104 uh, BC. They lost the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines then uh, took the, uh, the coveted uh, artifact uh, in their mind uh, down to uh, Shod, uh, and they put their particular, uh, uh, they took the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they stuck it before their god, Dagon. Uh, and Dagon, uh, the word dag in, in Hebrew, rep- references a fish. So the fish god, uh, their, their stone idol. And they put the Ark of the Covenant in front of their particular god to show subservience of the, uh, the Jewish god to their god. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting story if you read it in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Because um, the first day that uh, the Ark of the Covenant was before their god, they got up the next morning and their god had fallen off his pedestal and was laying down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. It's kind of amusing. <laughs> I mean, whoever said the Old Testament was boring? Um, and then, uh, they, they, so they repositioned their God because it's hard for people to give up their false gods. So they put their false God back up on the pedestal. And then the second time it fell, uh, its head and its hands were divinely broken off by the Almighty God. So it's not only just laying down, it's missing its hands and its head uh, to show that God is a true God of all gods. Um, and then God did something else, which is just kind of interesting. Um, he sent a plague among the Philistines because they had his ark. Uh, and it says that they had tumors. He, God sent tumors among them, but a more, a more precise translation uh, is hemorrhoidal tumors. <laughs> huh? Can you imagine if your entire army is stricken with this? How are you going to fight? It's just a question. And so, <laughs> so God sends this to them, and they're like, you've got to be kidding. And then, based on the translation, he also sent mice or rats, one of the two, Do you like those little things scurrying around your house? One freaks out the staff here. Imagine hundreds. Anyway, use your imagination. So they got, they got, they were logical people. What would you do if the presence of the ark has done this in your community? Get rid of this thing. I mean, get rid of this thing. So they did. So they sent it down, as you can see, to the city of Gath. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, And God did the same thing to people there. Struck them with the same kind of issue, which we won't mention. And the same thing happens to them. And so what did they do? They got rid of it as well. They sent it to the city of Ekron. And Ekron, the people up there, uh, they're like, you've got to be kidding. We heard what happened to these other cities. We don't need that happening here. So they eventually, uh, they, get, they get wise. And they, they send, this thing's got to go back to the Jews. We've got to send it to the Israelites. I'm getting to my question. 
So they did. They send, they send, send the Ark of the Covenant uh, to the Jews, and it goes to a city called Beit Shemesh. Uh, Beit is the Hebrew word for house. Shemesh is the sun. So the house of the sun. So that's where they send it. The Jews are so excited. If you read uh, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 6 about the story, they're so excited. The Ark is back after being gone forever. Uh, the Ark comes back, and they're, they is party central. They are so excited. Uh, they touch it. You know the German word verboten? Yeah, or pelegro or something like that. Thank you. Now think about it. They touch it. They don't just touch it in their excitement. They open the lid. Were you supposed to touch it? Were you supposed to look in it? No. And they did those two things. And when they did that, it says, if you read the, you know, read the context of, the, of, this, of this chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 6, that God struck down 50,070 people. Huh? Really? 50,070 people died for their progressive behavior. Well, it won't hurt. I mean, we got it back. It's exciting. God won't mind if I touch it. Yeah, he will. Because see, when God says don't do something, he doesn't change his mind. Well, 50,000 of them died. I'm still getting to my question. You with me? I haven't lost you? Okay, good. So they, they then send the ark to um, a place called Kiriath Jearim. And I've been there with my tour groups when I go. Uh, and uh, this is about 10 miles, as you can see from the map, about 10 miles northwest, or, uh, yeah, northwest of, uh, of Jerusalem. It's mountainous there. Uh, and eventually, in the t I'm getting to the question, and eventually in the time of David, uh, 1003 B.C., uh, so roughly 100 years later, David defeats the Jebusites, 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Uh, he wants to take the Ark of the Covenant from uh, the house of uh, uh, Abinadab uh, in Kiriath Jearim. He wants to take the Ark of the Covenant up the hill to Jerusalem to complete the worship of God. Novel desire. And so they load it onto a cart with some oxen. And they begin the journey up the hill to Jerusalem. As they're traveling up the hill to Jerusalem, uh, the ark begins to slip off of the cart. There's a man there. His name, this is Bible Trivia 101. His name? Uh, 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 Uza, I think is his name. Uh, Uzi, uh, not a Uzi. Uh, Uzza is like his name. Uh, yes. He, he's standing there walking alongside the ark. So if you see the ark of the covenant falling, what's the natural inclination? Catch it. He sticks out a hand to stop it. What happened to him? He died. Like when? Right then. Okay, do you see my question? I mean, is God capricious? N no. Is he unloving and unkind? I mean, no. I mean, then why did why that guy die instantly? What did God said? Do not touch this. Here's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it had uh, 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 rings that they could pass the poles through the golden uh, uh, box, and the priest could then pick it up and carry it. What was it on the cart for? Well, we improvised. Be ever easier heading uphill if we had it on a cart. We don't want to carry it uphill, etc. So they improvised. Did God say improvise? No, he's not in pro improvisational. God is not. He said, don't touch it. Don't put it on a cart. All these things. They did all the wrong things. And definitely, if it's falling off a cart, don't touch it. See, this was like willful sin on Uzzah's part to step forward and touch it. Because God said, don't ever touch it. For him to step forward and touch it, he was challenging the God because think of it this way. The God that can separate the Red Sea could certainly keep his ark from sliding off a cart. <laughs> Presumptuous of, of that man to think that. But it still leads to questions about God that seem kind of bothersome. Well, couldn't he have just like given him some kind of momentary something and then, then healed him and let him go his way? No, he set him out as an example that what I say does not deviate. Now, our progressive culture does not get the memo about God. In fact, that's what bothers them about God. They think everything's pliable, malleable, etc. God says, uh, no, it's not. And he said, I want to draw on the line in the sand to show you how important it is to follow my law, my rules. Now, this leads to, uh, when you look at Romans chapter 9 through 11, you want to talk about questions. It leads to tons of questions that the Jews in the Roman church have, and they're proposing to Paul, or he's at least anticipating their questions as a Jew, uh, the things he struggled with when he wasn't a Christian, because he'd been teaching this church, and they have lots of questions as Jews about what Paul's been teaching. Now, here's the thing. God loves you when you ask questions. I ask questions all the time of God. In fact, I write all my questions down when I'm studying, when I'm uh, taking apart the text and putting all my notes on the text. I write all my questions down. You should see my notes. 
But, and sometimes God gives the answer straight away. Sometimes he waits a few weeks, sometimes months, years, sometimes never. But he shows up many times to give wisdom and clarification. The, the Jews are of such a nature that they're, they're listening to Paul and they're saying, this is kind of an, a, an ooze kind of question. You know, Paul, we're kind of wondering, like you've talked about the doctrine of justification by faith. That to get saved, you've got to believe in Jesus by faith, and that's it. What about the Torah? I mean, the law of God. Is God done with the Torah? And you've said that he's now working with Gentiles? The Goyim? I mean, Paul, what's up with that? What, what about Israel? Is he done with Israel? Now, what we looked at in, as we've studied these questions and Paul's answers to them, um, it, what we studied last week was that God says, I'm, I'm going to choose to work with Gentiles based on what Hosea prophesied. We already studied that. And then he says, I also eventually in the future going to work with the remnant of Israel. I'm going to redeem them. And that leads to the question five that we're going to look at this morning, a perplexing question for a Jew. And it's a question that's it's totally applicable today because this question is our question as well. Here's the question. Question five, as Paul talks to the Jews at the church in Rome. Question five. In light of what you just said, Paul, that, Paul, that, Paul, that God's going to work with Gentiles and then a remnant of Jews, we have a question. What's the relationship between God's election and choosing and man's free will to choose? I mean, does he have a free will? Uh, does it appear that you have a free will? Yeah, it's almost lunchtime. Aren't you going to make choices? You're going to open the fridge. You're going to stare in there. Does God know what you're going to pick? Bologna, ham, does he know? Are you going to outfox God? No, he's omniscient. No. Uh, but you have choices as you open. From your perspective, you have choices. From his perspective, he knows what you're going to pick. Now, the mystery of it is, in his dimension, he's up there with his omniscience. He, Because he says in Romans 8, 28 to 30 that we've already studied, he predestines, he elects, he chooses, he's sovereign. He's all these things. That's in his, his dimension. In our dimension, we have a free will to make selections. That's the way that it looks. Uh, when I was uh, younger, knowing how much I love lawns, uh, as I've told you over the years, I love lawns. Um, I would go up to see my mom's sister, my Aunt Roberta. They had a beautiful house on a corner, white rock and custom homes, gorgeous. I love spending summers up there and mowing my aunt's yard. It was on the corner. It was beautiful, getting the crisscross lines and everything. And they had a sprinkling system, rainbird sprinkling system. And I would go out, and I would take a pair of Corona hand clippers, and I would cut around every single sprinkler and then dig it out. So it was primo. And I would step back and it's like, this is a work of art. One day, and I didn't tell this to the other services, so I'm sorry, I apologize to them. Because it just struck me about free will with my cousin. So my cousin, Stephen, my cousin, Stephen, he, he doesn't like lawns. He thinks I'm psycho for loving lawns. And so, you know, he, my uncle's last thing before he went to farming that day was, you guys take care of the yard. And, and so we did. So I was out, you know, cutting around all those things with the, with the Corona clippers. And it's a huge yard. And my cousin, I don't know where he is. And so I round that corner to see him standing there with a bottle, bottle of lighter fluid. Interesting. What was he doing with that? He was walking over each hole of a sprinkler, and he's going, Tsh! and then he'd drop a match in there. <laughs> and he'd walk to the next one, and he would squirt lighter fluid in there, drop a match in there. <laughs> so... <laughs> Logical, illogical. Illogical. My side of the yard, pristine, beautiful. His, burn holes. <laughs> Everywhere. Did he have the free will to do that? Yeah, yeah. He had the free will. Did God know Stephen was going to do that? Yeah. And if I would have known he was going to do that, I'd have put a stop to that sin. Just don't do that. <laughs> See, <laughs> you have a free will. To choose. And so what God's going to tell us through the pen of Paul here is, uh, I'm going to explain to you now in more detail the relationship between my election and choice uh, and your free will to choose. Because you have the opportunity to either embrace the gospel or efface the gospel, reject it. And so he's going to talk about G Gentiles first uh, and how they responded to the gospel of God, uh, even though he had chosen and elected some of them to be saved. And he's going to also talk about the Jews. Uh, to answer the question about the relationship between God's election uh, and man's free choice to choose. So let's look at his answer. Answer number one. He's going to show us here in answer number one that the Gentiles uh, are freely and favorably those who respond typically to God. When you wouldn't think that they would. Because when you look historically at Gentiles, uh, Paul's going to say, the last thing on the Gentilic mind was pursuing God in salvation based on justification by faith in Jesus. Not 
not in their purview, all right? So in verse 30, Paul says, what shall we say then of what I just said in the last few verses that we studied last week about God dealing with the Gentiles and with the Jews as a remnant? What should we say about that, his choice to do that? He says, he says well, we should say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, what happened to them? Well, they found it. They attained righteousness. Well, what kind of righteousness, Paul? Well, even the righteousness which is by faith. So the people who didn't have a theophany, of an appearance of God, like at Mount Sinai, uh, they didn't have the Torah, the law, the revelation of God, as the Jews got at Mount Sinai. They didn't have all those things. They who were not looking for Jesus, well, he found them. And they who were not looking for righteousness to be attained by faith in Jesus, they got saved when they weren't looking for him. You have to stop and kind of ask yourself, when you got saved, if you're a Christian, were you really in pursuit of God? Or did he kind of rock your world, and the next thing you know, you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and you get saved, and you wonder, what happened to me? You know what I'm saying? A lot of people get saved like that. And that's what he's talking about. Those who did not pursue righteousness. The word in Greek is a hunting term. I mean, you ever hunted? What's the goal when you go out? Food for my family, right? When you go fishing, what's the goal? Food for my family. I mean, I've done it. You go out with a depth finder. You're in the ocean. I've been on those ships before. The, there's a school of fish under the boat. The captain says, everybody drop your lines now. You do it. He says, the fish are at 500 feet. You do it. You drop them right there because the goal is to bring the food home, right? You're pursuing them. He says, when you think about, think about the Gentiles, they weren't hunting for, for God's righteousness at all. It's the last thing in their memory banks. They were polytheistic. They were worshiping the creation, not the creator, etc. But they're the ones who found righteousness. If they weren't pursuing God and they were pursuing everything other than God, does that mean that Gentiles back then and even now, if they don't pursue God, does that mean they're not moral? No. They're spiritually dead, but does that mean they, they're not moral? Oh, no, they're, they're moral. Well, there's a lot of non-Christians that are moral. In fact, sometimes non-Christians are more moral than who? Christians. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend of mine uh, who... Uh, Needed a roof on his house in California, so he knew a, a guy at another church who was an elder at a church, and he had a roofing company. So he thought, hey, I'll trust him. The guy put the roof on his house, put part of it on his house, and never came back again. And so he contacted me. What's up with the elder at that church? You should finish the job, right? You know, so it's sometimes the non-Christian is more moral than the other. Why? Because he's responding to the light that's given unto him. And so uh, Jay uh, Bud Zizewski, who's a uh, philosophy professor at the University of Texas in Austin, wrote a book that I think every Christian should read. And it's not the kind of book you just read. You want to read this book and, like, study this book. The title of the book, What We Can't Not Know. He, I know he has a Ph.D. He wrote the title. Take it up with him. What We Can't Not Know. Um, what is he talking about? He talks about how in our culture we've, we've lost the concept that we're all responsible to natural law. It's, all, it's built into the warp and woof of our being. So that we all know when we sit down uh, to, to do things, there's certain things that just, they're just true. You don't lie. You don't steal. You don't run around on your mate. You don't commit murder. I mean, etc. There's just certain things we all understand in cultures. And so he says we've lost the value of this. And this all, if we understand this, this leads to God's absolute truths. So it doesn't mean that a, a Gentile can't act in a moral way, but he's spiritually, he's dead. And he needs God. But he's not pursuing God because of his, his spiritual death. And we know from John 6 that God has to draw and woo the sinner to himself. But he's not in pursuit of God. But the, the very one who's not pursuing God, Paul says, attains righteousness by faith. That's a key preposition. By faith means by means of faith, which means there's no other way to get righteous before God than by means of faith in Jesus, his death and resurrection. Any other thing will not save and will not give you righteousness. And Paul says, uh, or, or, uh, let me explain to you, he explain to you through his example uh, what he's talking about. Think about Paul uh, when he went to Mars Hill and, and when he was in Athens. Uh, when, if you ever dropped Paul off somewhere for a little re re rest and relaxation, he would end up engaging people with the gospel of Christ. Imagine him. He winds up in the Areopagus uh, uh, where all the intelligentsia are, the Stoics, the Epicurean philosophers. I mean, the creme de la creme of the academic world in Athens. And here comes Paul, you know, with his tunic, walking around. He sees thousands of idols, uh, and he sees one that says at the base of it, to the unknown God. 
they have totally covered themselves, have they not? They've got all these Gentiles, they've got every kind of God you can imagine. And in case they missed one, we got one to one we don't even know yet. What Paul do? You know the story? He tells them, I know this unknown God. It's Jesus. He's come to earth. He's died for our sins. He's rose again. And if you trust in him as your Savior, you shall be saved. How did they respond to that? They who were not looking for God. Uh, it says in verse 32, it's very interesting. Now, when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to do what academics do. What'd they do? Sneered. You guys, he's, 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 he's a loser. Are you kidding me? Death and then resurrection? No way. Uh, but others said, uh, they're, they're, they're more of the malleable type academics. Uh, we shall hear of you again concerning this. We, we can entertain the discussion. Uh, so Paul went out of their midst. Notice the contrast in verse 34. Those who had gone up to the hill to be enlightened with Greek philosophy, um, some of the men joined him, and they did what? They believed. What they believed? That they were sinners in need of a Savior. These are Gentiles not looking for God. God found them on that hill that day. They believed, and he said, let me name some of them for you, um, among whom were also Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others. Imagine, they went up the hill, totally lost, not in search of God, thinking they're okay, and on the hill they found out, I'm a sinner, I'm in need of a Savior, and they're Gentiles, and they attained the righteousness of God through Christ. See, that's what Paul says, an amazing irony. The Jews, of all people, should have had that righteousness, as he's going to argue in a minute, but they didn't get it because they went about it the wrong way. And he says, don't you find it interesting that the Gentiles recognized, I have a free will to do what I want to do. I heard the gospel, and on my free will, I am choosing to follow the Christ. Have you made the decision to follow the Christ? It's your free will choice, Paul says. He's talking about the Jews. He turns in uh, uh, verse 31, and he's going to spend the rest of the chapter 10 talking about this. He says, uh, think about the Jews. It's totally ironic. They freely and unfavorably responded to God's gospel. It should have been the opposite. So the Gentiles who had no light per se, a special nature to turn to God, get saved when that special light comes to them like on Mars Hill. But the Jews have the special light. They have theophanies of God where he appears. They have uh, the special word from God where he gives them the Ten Commandments, etc. But notice what they do in verse 31. But Israel, notice the contrast with which word? But, states the contrast. But Israel, what they do? They were pursuing a law of righteousness. They didn't arrive at that law. What's that mean? Well, instead of worshiping the Lord of the law, they worship the law, not the Lord. They flipped it. See, this is, this is how crafty Satan is. He can take even a great thing of God and flip it around so you're misled. They should have worshiped the Lord of the law by faith. Instead, they said, in order for us as sinners to attain presence of God, we must work our way there by obedience to the law. They totally missed what God was telling them. They pursued the law of righteousness. They didn't arrive at the law. Why? Because you cannot please God by your performance. Look at it this way. If you could please God by your performance, then Jesus came and died and rose again for no reason. And that's super important. If you think your works mean something to God, that, that will garner favor, favor with him, his son died for no reason. Paul says, the Jews flipped this around. It says in verse 32, wh why'd they do this? It says, because they did not pursue it, salvation, righteousness, by faith, but as though were by works. They did it by works. See, Jews bought into that whole mentality back then. Oh, God gave us the Torah. We must do everything the Torah says. How many commandments were there? How many? 613 and 10 big ones. The 10th the one was the hardest one. What was the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not what? Do you remember? Covet. That's the hardest one because that's internal. Because all of somebody has to do is get a new camel and you want one. <laughs> or a BMW, whatever it is today. You know, see what I'm saying? You know, who hasn't gone to the store and you're looking at your, your, your shoes, your Asics or whatever, and you're thinking they look good, and you look at the new ones on the, on the rack, and you compare them to your, I've done this, and you <laughs> compare them to yours, and you're going, wow, man, mine are toast. I need me a pair of those, covet. Next thing you know, you got a new pair of shoes when you weren't even going in there for shoes. You know, so it's just like you can't fulfill the law and please God because you're sinful, and you're always going to blow it somewhere, and if you, if you blow it at one point, you blow all of them. So what did the Israelites do? Well, uh, Leon Morris, a New Testament scholar, puts it this way. He says that righteousness is by faith, by means of faith, but the Jews did not come about it by faith. They sought the right goal indeed, though they did it in the wrong way. Could you imagine going to eternity without God 
because of that premise. You had a passion to do moral things, but you didn't come by God's way. You came by your way. Well, what's your way? Well, trying to work my way there, <laughs> thinking that God will look down at me on judgment day and say, oh, you're a pretty good guy. You're, you're, you're pretty good. There's some minor flaws in there, but you're pretty good. I'll let you into heaven. It, no, no, you, no, he won't. Because your righteousness will not save you. This is what Paul says. Why do people, like the Jews back in Paul's day, uh, devise systems of belief that shall not save? It's called one word. It's called pride. What's pride say? Pride says, I'm a good person. Therefore, my works must count somehow, some way to God. They won't. That's what Paul's arguing here. Do not be deceived, he says. Because he says they came by their own method of righteousness, works, not by the work of Christ on the cross. The very ones who should have been saved by faith in the Messiah rejected the Messiah. Go down to verse 32. What happened when the Messiah came along and revealed himself? What does Paul say? Verse 32. He's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, and chapter 28, verse 16. He says, they, the Jews, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and he who believes in him, the stone is not a stone per se, it's Jesus, he's the him, will not be disappointed. He says on judgment day, if you came to God by his terms, the work of Christ, not your work, and you have faith that saves you, you'll not be disappointed on judgment day. Why? Because you're his child. But many will be, be disappointed on judgment day because they will come before God and say, look at my works. And he will say, as you read Matthew 17, I don't know you, depart from me. See, his work is what matters. Pride says, my works must be important. And Paul says, no, your, your pride has caused you to stumble all over Jesus, who's, who is the cornerstone of the building. Here's a, uh, a statement from Jesus, Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. What does Jesus say? He says, did you ever read the scriptures? Now, bear in mind, he's speaking to Jews who study the scriptures. This is an interesting statement. Of course, they'd read the scriptures. Haven't you ever read the scriptures that the stone the builders rejected, this became the cornerstone? This came about from the Lord, and it's marvelous in his eyes. He's telling them, I am the chief cornerstone of God's heavenly temple. Uh, you're going to reject me, but I'm the main stone, and you're going to trip all over me. Uh, in Luke chapter 20, uh, Jesus says in verse 17, uh, but Jesus looked at the Jews and he said to them, what then is it that is written, like in the Old Testament, what was written? Uh, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. He's going to relate that to himself. Everyone who falls on that, this is a warning, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces like a clay pot, uh, and, but whoever, on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So if you look at Jesus as the cornerstone, trip all over him as being the Messiah, the Savior, and you will not have him. You have your works, not his work. He says that stone, i.e. me, will judge you one day. It will not be life. It will be eternal punishment. They tripped all over Jesus. I sat down on my desk this week and began to write down all the reasons why they tripped all over Jesus. Because our culture still trips all over Jesus today, do they not? Jews and Gentiles. But you have the free choice to not trip all over Jesus, but to embrace him. Why'd they trip over him? I'll give you some ideas. Number one, uh, Jesus called for them to believe in him and him only. Remember John chapter 14, verse six? He's very definitive. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. Talk about narrow. He said the gate is narrow. Wide is the path to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. They did not like his absolutist teaching. Number two, um, his miracles on the Sabbath really bothered them. Because he would give somebody new eyesight on the Sabbath, Shabbat, and they were more worried about the law. You shall not work on the Sabbath because you've worked, you've sinned. He's more concerned about the person than some law they constructed. They hated him for that. Um, he had the audacity to, 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 bef to befriend wicked people. who Jesus hang out with? I mean, think about who he hung out with. Prostitutes, embezzlers, drunks, etc. That's who he hung out with. The truly spiritual would look at him and say, look at who his friends are. If he was really the Messiah, he wouldn't be near those sinners. No, he came to die for those sinners. But they hated him for that. Uh, there was one point in John chapter 4, he actually uh, walked upon Samaritan soil heading north uh, in Israel, and he had a conversation with a Samaritan woman, a half-breed of all people, who were hated by the Jews. And he, he stopped and talked with her at a well, and, and it was a woman he had a conversation with, which was verboten. He did it anyway. And he led her into the kingdom, did he not? And they hated him for that because he talked to a Samaritan. Um, they, they, 
absolutely loathed the fact in John 8, 58, that he claimed he was the I am of all history, of all time, of all space. And they tried to stone him after that and kill him. Um, they hated the fact he was crucified because that was a shame to them. Uh, and they hated him because he would not conform uh, to their messianic expectations because they wanted a savior to deliver them from Roman occupation. When he comes into Jerusalem, it's not riding a stallion, is it? That's riding a donkey because he comes to fulfill the words of the prophets that he would come to them as a humble servant and be the, the sacrifice before he would be the king. You know, our world still struggles with those, Jews and Gentiles, free choice. He says the Gentiles weren't even looking for the Messiah and found him and got saved. That was their free choice. He said, my people uh, have historically been exposed to great things from God and have rejected him. This is a scary thing. You can sit in church day after day, month after month, year after year, hear the word of God, hear great truth, and reject it all outright. It's your free choice. But what's the wise person do? Well, they come to terms with the fact that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and I embrace that savior by faith. The greatest thing you will ever do is to exercise your free will to follow Jesus Christ. Because at that precise mystical moment, he forgives you, washes you clean, and makes you a child. Best not to stumble all over him. Best to walk up to him to say, Lord, I need you now more than ever. And at that moment, your free will connects with his sovereign choice. Let's pray. God, thank you for the greatness of the cross of Christ. How mysterious are your ways, how deep is your word, uh, and how much you love those who do not know you. And we pray for those in our church. We've been praying for them all morning uh, that you would work a wonder, draw them to yourself, cause them to see that they need to make a decision uh, to follow you and to embrace you as the Lord of their life and that you will forgive them and wash them anew and make them a saint for all time. Thank you for the opportunity to read and study Paul's words and uh, bless his words to our lives as only you can in Christ's name. Amen.